So it's a real great pleasure today uh, to welcome Megan Leslie uh, to our campus. And, and in fact, uh, David Hopper and myself, we uh, arranged to, uh, to link this up with a, a class. In fact, David and I have actually invited Megan to speak at different times previously. And so uh, we thought we should join forces and, um, and have a, a nice room full of folks here uh, today. Uh, the title for this talk today, Canada and the Environment, is pretty broad. Uh, leaving Megan plenty of room to pick the where, where she wants to focus. Uh, and she's no uh, stranger to discussing environmental topics. So as some of, uh, probably all of you have, uh, have seen from the announcement for this talk, uh, Megan's the, uh, the environment critic for the New Democratic Party, which is the official opposition in the, in the federal uh, political scene. She's also the deputy leader of the NDP, which is, uh, Another very impressive uh, aspect, and and perhaps the most important point, although you know that might not be in the order they're usually presented. She's the member of parliament for right where we are here in Halifax. Uh, so, depending on your perspective, one of those might be more important than the other. But uh, but she has all three of those uh, of those hacks uh, to um, to deal with, I guess. So I'm not going to read out a, a, a biography. I, I could, but I won't because you can find it uh, all over the place. I'm going to uh, leave more time for Megan to present, and I know she's uh, she's keen to uh, engage with with people here. So, think of any points, any questions you want to uh, to raise, and there'll be time for that as well. Thanks so much, Megan. Thank you. Thanks. you are here just cuz <laughs> thank you thank you for coming just cuz that's nice um, so I actually looked over Tony's shoulder at the poster to make sure I had prepared for the right topic and I have so step one's done uh, and so what I want to talk about today is where Canada is on the environment front but really particularly through my lens as a federally elected official, so as an MP. So what is Canada doing in Parliament? What legislation have we seen or not seen? Um, we only have an hour, so I'll try and cover some of the major changes, and I hope to leave some time for Q&A after. And uh, I'll start with uh, my experience as the environment critic started in 2011. So in 2011, we had this this election and things, you know, I'm with the NDP, things really changed for the NDP. We, we were, you know, thrust into official opposition status for the first time in history. Whole bunch of new MPs, many of whom are from Quebec. Whole bunch of young MPs, first time we've ever seen MPs uh, so, so young before. Not all were young, but uh, we had the youngest MP in the history of the Canadian Parliament was elected in 2011. So all this change is happening, all these things are happening at the time. Uh, the leader was Jack Layton, and I was in Ottawa for caucus meetings, so getting together with my caucus to talk about, well, geez, who are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> what are we going to do in the next four years? And I was out for dinner uh, with my partner, and my phone rang, and I knew that Jack was going to be making phone calls to people to set out the shadow cabinet. So you know there's cabinet. We have ministers, ministers are in charge of certain responsibilities. We do have a minister of environment, we have a minister of fisheries and oceans, we have a minister of finance. So usually the opposition parties will create something called a shadow cabinet where we designate certain people to be critics of those portfolios. So if there's a finance minister, we have a finance critic who is responsible for um, talking, talking about what is happening that the finance minister is doing, presenting that party's alternative to what the finance minister is doing and really communicating on behalf of that party on the finance portfolio. So I knew Jack was uh, making the phone calls to ask people to serve in the shadow cabinet and he, uh, my phone rang and I was in this little restaurant on Bank Street and it was noisy as heck so I ran downstairs. Uh, it was this is actually how politics works. Uh, I was in the grimiest, grossest hallway in the basement beside the men's washroom. And I was like, hey Jack, how are you? No, no, no trouble. You're not interrupting anything. And he asked if I would serve as the environment critic. Now, I was pretty thrilled when he asked me to do that because all I've ever wanted to do 
All I've ever wanted to work on are issues of justice. And for me, justice is environmental justice, social justice, and economic justice. My background here in Halifax, I used to work at Dalhousie Legal Aid on poverty issues. So economic justice and social justice was at the forefront of the paid work that I was doing in Halifax. But environmental justice is also really important to me. Um, <laughs> right, I was telling Tony, I, I used to actually be, um, I, was, I created the first ever environmental group at my high school, the Kirkland Lake Collegiate and Vocational Institute. And uh, we started up an environment group. I was the first ever president. Our name was Youth for Environmental Sanctity. Yes, <laughs> it's like the worst name ever for a group. Uh, we were yes, and so I was really excited at this opportunity to serve as the environment critic. And so I was on the phone with Jack and I said, okay, I wanna meet with you and talk about what is my mandate? What, what do you want me to work on? Uh, what do you want me to accomplish in this portfolio? And he said, yep, Megan, there's a lot going on right now. We'll meet later, but know this. In my mind, the most important issue facing us today is climate change. Because climate change affects health, climate change affects poverty, climate change affects security, and we can't tackle any issue if we don't have a plant. So your mandate is climate change, and we'll get into the details later. There was no later. <laughs> We know that history. Uh, Jack Layton uh, got very sick and, and he passed away, he died that fall. We had a leadership race and uh, Tom Mulcair won the leadership race. So when he became our leader, uh, I said to him, he, he phoned me and said, would you carry on this portfolio of environment? And I said, look, I, I had a talk with Jack, it was short, but his mandate for me was climate change and I think that's the mandate that I should continue to have. And, and Tom said, yes, you know, there are more details and we fleshed it out, but he agrees that climate change is the most important issue facing us today. So I have the same mandate. And that's what I've been doing, working on issues of climate change in the House of Commons. How? How does one do that? Well, there are different ways. Uh, there are positive efforts that I can make. So actually presenting ideas, putting out information, sort of positive action. And how I do that, for example, is I ask questions about climate change in the House of Commons. Uh, in the last year, iPolitics did a handy little chart of words that people said in the House of Commons, and I talked about climate change more than anyone else. Uh, I, I won't get really partisan in this talk, but I will say that the environment minister only said the words climate change a handful of times. Uh, but so I've been there, I've been asking those questions. I brought forward a private member's bill that would legislate greenhouse gas reductions, another example of a positive action to d try and bring attention to and, and force action on climate change. I've supported my colleagues in other parties, sometimes, in my party, of course, when they want to bring forward legislation or private members' bills on energy efficiency or renewables or other greenhouse gas reduction number, uh, measures. And I've done those things while trying to get media attention to the issue, while trying to get Canadians engaged with the issue of climate change and have them believe that there is a role for government here and there is a role for the federal government here. On the positive front as well, on the idea of being uh, an en engaging and a, an initiator, you can also bring forward ideas to committee. So when you have the Minister of Finance and the Department of Finance, you have the Minister of Environment and the Department of Environment, there are committees that are attached, not attached, but um, there are committees that fall under the same portfolio. And these committees are made up of <coughs> members of the House of Commons. The committee membership is made up on a prorated basis, so based on the number of seats you have in the house. So we actually sit in a room with a rectangular table and there is a chair. The chair is usually, not always, but usually a government member. So the chair is conservative, but in theory working as a neutral chair, in theory. <laughs> there, 
were, the, the committee composition changed a little bit recently, but there, there were four NDP members, one liberal member, and six conservatives. And that's based on the composition of the House. When it was the last parliament and it was a minority, um, off the top of my head, I think there were three liberal, two block, one NDP, and uh, five conservatives. So the conservatives were outnumbered. So this is what happens at committee. This is the reality. Hey, where's the Green Party? Where's the block? Uh, how come Elizabeth May isn't there? Well, you're not an officially recognized party unless, uh, I'm actually going to pick on Andy. Is it seven? Seven seats? Uh, Fourteen. Fourteen? Jeez. No, twelve, I'm sorry. Oh, well, let's split the difference and it's say twelve. 12. You have to have twelve, or maybe seven, or maybe fourteen. Look at us. <laughs> There's a certain number of seats you have to have before you're an officially recognized party. Uh, so the Bloc Québécois does not have enough seats, nor does the Green Party. Any member of parliament has the right to sit in on committee and sit at that table. Uh, they don't have the right to vote. Uh, they don't have the right to ask questions. They can ask permission to ask questions, get consent, uh, but they don't have a right to do that. So this is what committee looks like. What does committee do? Committee studies environmental legislation. Oh, this, this committee is NV for environment. <laughs> and they're all bilingual, so it's environnement. Uh, so we study legislation, environmental legislation that comes through. What happens when there's no legislation? Well, we as members of this committee, I'm on this committee, we can bring forward motions to do studies on different environmental topics and, and really delve into environment issues and think about what's the role of the federal government here. So, as the NDP environment critic, I have brought forward a whole hell of a lot of motions on climate change. Uh, just a sampling, we brought forward one to review the government's sectoral approach to greenhouse gas regulations. You don't have to translate every, I'm going to speak fast, you can go blah 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 if that helps. <laughs> uh, greenhouse gas regulations to review the delays in establishing regulations for the oil and gas sector. Uh, a national, a study on the national capacity to assess, mitigate and cope with the impacts of climate change. We did one on climate change and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. We did one on uh, a study on the Joint Oil Sands Water, or Joint Oil Sands Water Monitoring Program, uh, that the, we should study climate change in the Arctic, that we should talk about climate change and the delegation to Warsaw, that we should talk about climate change and the Environment Commissioner. All of these motions brought forward. Does anybody remember reading about any of this in the news, that we did these fantastic studies on climate change? I see some cynical no's. Well, how come we didn't actually have any of these studies? Six conservatives. Yeah, the six conservatives. So you bring a mo you move a motion, you're out, it's public meeting, you move a motion, and very often what happens is we go in camera, in camera's basically in secret. Doors are closed, no recording, no minutes, no public votes, no record. We go in camera and hold a vote, and the motion's defeated very often. Um, you know if it's defeated if you never see anything about it ever again. <laughs> if it's passed, then there's a document that comes out that says we're going to study this, this issue. So all of these motions, none of them have made it out of in camera. None of them have made it out of a secret vote. No minutes, no results, nothing. And it's not just that we're not able, we're not successful in getting these climate change motions brought forward to, to have these studies. It's not just that. It's actually more insidious than that. The motions that have passed, so there was a motion on uh, studying a conservation strategy. Okay, well, conservation, uh, and this wasn't conservation like energy conservation, this was conservation like land and animals and waterways. So if there's a conservation plan, we would ask questions about climate change. Okay, that makes sense. If you're going to have a conservation plan, how does climate change impact it? Will you have to do different, have a different plan to deal with climate change adaptation? Uh, have you thought about 
there's a, there, there aren't many seats, but grab a seat. <laughs> uh, maybe you'd have to think about using uh, conservation of land as a carbon sink. Like there are all kinds of ways to bring up climate change when you're talking about a conservation plan. What would happen? We would get ruled out of order that climate change was outside the scope of the study of conservation, if you can believe it. And conservatives actually got smart, and I'm putting smart in scare quotes here, uh, so to speak, because they would create their own topics with really, really, really narrow subjects. So I'll use an example from the Health Committee. Health Committee had a study on the negative, oh, it wasn't negative, the harms, the harms of marijuana use. Harms. Couldn't talk about positive benefits of medical marijuana, couldn't talk about harms. Uh, we had, come on in. We had a talk on, or not a talk, a study at Natural Resources. Oh my gosh, this is actually really heartbreaking. Uh, Natural Resources, and it was on the benefits of oil sands development. Well, I, I've got no problems with the benefits of the oil sands development. I mean, I see the commercials, they're shoved down my throat every day. So, uh, but the idea that you can't talk about anything else. And so Chief Alan Adam is the chief of Fort Chippewan First Nation, a downstream First Nation from the oil sands, a downstream First Nations First Nation with documented higher elevated rates of very rare cancers, uh, a, a community where they can't drink the water, a community where they can't eat the fish. Like, it's forbidden to eat the fish because the fish are contaminated. So Chief Alan Adam is testifying as a witness and he starts to talk about the increased rates of rare cancer in his community. And I, I'm being taped. Uh, joke you not, what's, what's the word without the SH word? Kid I kid you not, not. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> There's the, yeah, <laughs> the censors. I kid you not, the chair said, Chief, Chief Adam, you're going to actually have to talk about the benefits of the oil sands, because that's what this study is, so if you could, uh, limit your comments to the benefits. So that's actually what is happening at committee. Any politician who tells you, oh, but the real work is done at committee and it's so fulfilling, is giving you a line. Nothing is happening at committee right now. We are able to accomplish nothing when it comes to climate change. So, being the environment critic, you know, Jack Layton, to talk about him again, he always did say we can't just be oppositional, we have to be propositional. So I'm giving you these examples of being propositional, actually putting out ideas. But you know what? It is our job to be oppositional as well. So as a critic in a shadow cabinet, it's, it would be your job to look at what it is that government's doing and react to it. Sometimes oppose it sometimes offer ideas to shape it, but you are also in reaction to what it is that government is doing. So, in reaction to what has government done in the past four years since I've been uh, the environment critic. When I've been talking about how at committee you study legislation, but I've been giving you examples of, of studies that weren't about legislation. Why? Because we actually haven't had a lot of legislation on environment. So something like the Species at Risk Act, it's in the legislation that you have to do a review. The House of Commons has to do a review of it after, is it five or seven years? I think it's five years. Some uh, Different legislations, five versus seven. We have to do a legislative review at committee. It's not been done. Canadian uh, Environmental Protection Act, SEPA. There is a, I think it's seven for SEPA. There is a legislative review for SEPA. We haven't done that review. And there hasn't been very much environmental legislation coming down, so we haven't been able to look at things at committee. But in 2012, we had a flurry <laughs> of legislative changes. So if you remember 2012, um, we had, there was a budget that came down. There's a budget that comes down every year. That's not unusual. In 2012, there was a budget that came down. Budget is not a legal document. It's, it's this idea, it's this concept. I, our government will do X and we promise to do Y. So it's, it's, it's sort of a theoretical document. It's not legislation. So in order to enact legislation, you, are, you need to have a Budget Implementation Act. So it's a piece of legislation that says, here are the concepts in our budget and here's how we're gonna do it. 
So the Budget Implementation Act in 2012, we actually had two of them, C-38 in the spring and C-45 in the fall. You probably heard lots about it in the news. They were giant omnibus budgets. Uh, they were hundreds and hundreds of pages long. They were rammed through really quickly. That's a story for another day. I mean, that's separate to what's going on uh, with environment. I want to talk about what was in those budgets and how environmental legislation uh, and how our environmental legislative regime has changed since 2012. So the first thing in C-38 is the Canadian Environmental... Uh, can't even read that. <laughs> what the heck does that say? <laughs> assessment Act, CF. So the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, when there's going to be a project, you have to do an environmental assessment. Well, in 2012, CIA uh, was not amended. It was not tinkered or tweaked. It was repealed and replaced with a new law. So what are we repealing? What, what's important about CIA? Well, CIA is one of the key federal laws that exists to promote sustainable development across Canada and prevent environmental degradation before it occurs. And that's really important because a lot of our environmental regulation, you think about fines, if people do, you know, they, there's a spill, there's fines, there's uh, maybe uh, criminal charges. A lot of what we have on the books is a reaction uh, this is about prevention of environmental degradation. And the key purpose of an environmental assessment is to look before you leap. So let's assess before we actually do this project and think about the long-term environmental consequences of a development proposal before we decide whether or not we should proceed. So environmental assessment under SIA is one you know what, I'm going to skip to what the changes were. We did get a brand new law with SIA. What are some, there's lots and lots and lots of changes. What are some of the key changes? One is appropriate substitute. So appropriate substitute. This is a key change. It says that a federal environmental assessment will not take place as long as the province has a, quote, appropriate substitute. So that kind of makes sense intuitively. It's like, well, if Nova Scotia's got, a, got an Environmental Assessment Act, then you know, why should we redouble our efforts and do it federally? In your gut, you're like, yeah, I can deal with that. Except that across the board in Canada, until this new act, provincial legislation has been historically much weaker than federal legislation. And if we look at Fish Lake, for example, in British Columbia, a British Columbia Environmental Review gave a green light to uh, a mining proposal to use Fish Lake as a tailing stump when an environmental assessment at the federal level said, no, we're actually rejecting this outright. So that's a huge change. The other, another big change is movement from trigger to list. What does that mean? With the old Environmental Assessment um, Act, an environmental assessment was triggered, so to speak, when a project touched an area of federal jurisdiction. So if you think about federal jurisdiction, migratory birds, right? They cross borders, they don't care, they're not just gonna stay in Nova Scotia, they're gonna go wherever they want. We can't control the birds, uh, and nor should we. So <laughs> the, uh, if, if your project is going to impact migratory birds, that's federal, it would trigger an environmental assessment. If it uh, was a trans-provincial waterway, if you have a project that's going to affect a trans-provincial waterway, it would trigger an environmental assessment. Now, we don't have the trigger system. We have a list. So there are a list of projects that require environmental assessment. What's the problem with that? Well, the list is pretty small. The list can be changed by cabinet. It doesn't have to be a list that you and I agree on. It can be a list that, you know, five guys in blue suits agree on. The other thing with the list is there are some really important things happening out there that aren't on the list. So seismic testing in the Gulf of St. Lawrence is not on the list. 50 years ago, oil sands exploration would not have been on the list. Why? We didn't know we could do it. Like we just didn't know we would have that kind of technology. 
So can you imagine oil sands exploration and oil sands uh, uh, exploitation with no environmental assessment? It's hard to wrap around your head around. The Environment Commissioner came to committee. That was exciting. That was a moment where we did real things at committee. He came to committee and he talked about this change because we're studying the legislation. And I asked a question about, uh, so there's probably going to be fewer environmental assessments now that there's just a list and not this trigger. And uh, I said, how many, wh what's the difference? And he said, well, Right now, the range, this is in 2012, he said right now the range is from about four to 6,000 environmental assessments a year, and we're gonna see that drop to 20 to 30. And I said, 20 to 30,000? <laughs> he was like, no, no, 20 for the whole country. So, really big change. The other really big change that I'll flag with you is public participate, participation. So if you want to be involved in an environmental assessment, you want to engage in this process, it's gonna affect you, it's gonna affect your, your community. It used to be that an interested party could participate. If you were interested, come to the party, right? You're gonna be a part of this. You can have some kind of way of participating in this process. Now it has changed to directly affected. What does directly affected mean? I don't know. If you are a scientist in Vancouver who studies um, uh, bitumen leaks on waterways and they, that's happening in the, you know, the pipeline, the Northern Gateway pipeline, are you, are you directly affected? I don't know. Uh, if you live 10 kilometers downstream, are you directly affected? If you live 100 kilometers downstream, are you directly affected? About a thousand. So this is a significant change and we haven't really seen how it's played out yet. I don't even, I can't even tell you um, where it's going yet. Fisheries Act. It's also in C-38. What were the big changes in the Fisheries Act? Um, Fisheries Act used to be one of our strongest environmental protections. It was used to protect fish habitat. This is key, the word habitat. Because if you protect fish habitat, you're protecting fish. You are protecting where uh, they spawn. You are protecting the food that they eat. You are protecting uh, the habitat where they hide from predators and actually have a chance of survival. Now, we don't protect fish habitat. We protect fish. But we only protect very specific types of fish. So we only protect fish that are a part of a commercial fishery, a recreational fishery, or an aboriginal fishery. Uh, sorry. Fishery is not the word that they use. I take that word back. It's, it's, it's more like um, commercial importance, uh, First Nations importance. I think the word might be, Kess, do you know what the word is? Yeah, I think it's more like uh, importance. Um, so commercial, recreational, or, or First Nations importance. Okay, so only those fish. So that means um, what? How do you protect them? They can't be harmed. They have to protect them from serious harm. What is serious harm? Serious harm is effectively killing them. So you can destroy their breeding ground. That's okay. You can maim them. You can deform them. You can kill their source of food. Essentially, with these new rules, a fish with three heads, the Simpsons fish, is a-okay. As long as you don't kill it, but you can kill it if it's not of recreational or commercial or First Nations importance. So huge, huge, huge changes. Then we have in the fall, C45, so another Budget Implementation Act. All kinds of stuff, hundreds of pages long, all kinds of things are changed. But one thing that's changed that's very important to environment regulation in Canada is the Navigable Waters Act. So, first of all, the name has changed. Why is that important? 
It changed from Navigable Waters oh, Protection Act, I'm too close to the board to see what I'm writing, to the Navigation Protection Act. So it means we're no longer protecting waters. We are only protecting navigation. Why is that important? The Navigable Waters Protection Act is one of Canada's oldest uh, environmental laws. It was enacted by Parliament in 1882. Because if you think about our history and the use of waterways and for navigation, navigation was extremely important to protect, but the idea was you can't just protect navigation, you actually have to protect the water. If you're going to protect navigation, you have to protect the water. The water has to be clean. The water has to, you can't fill in lakes, right? So it was this idea that navigation and water, you can't separate them. So previously, all navigable waters were protected in Canada. What were navigable waters? Actually defined as whatever you can float a canoe on. <laughs> that was actually a navigable water. Uh, so some ditches, right? Mm -hmm. If you could float a canoe on it, it was a navigable water. It was worthy of our protection. So we don't actually know the numbers. Our best guess is 32,000 lakes, two and a half million rivers. That's just a guess. So now we don't protect navigable waters. Now we protect navigation. And we come back to the trusty idea of having a list. And there are a list of waterways that are protected. What waterways are protected? Well, three oceans, thank God. Yes, we're not going to, you know, put, build a bridge over the Atlantic. I don't know. So the three oceans are protected. I'm grateful for that. Um, 97 lakes and portions of 62 rivers. Why portions? Because, for example, Rouge River, only part of it is protected, and the part of it that's protected is the part that doesn't have a pipeline across it. Where the pipeline is, there's no protection. So now 99.7% of lakes are not protected in Canada. 99.9, .9. that, that stat doesn't exist, right? 99.9, .9, that's just something you say off the top of your head to prove a point. 99.9% .9 of rivers in Canada are not protected. So if we go back to the idea of the trigger as well, before, if you had a project that touched a navigable water, had an impact on navigable water, it would trigger an environmental assessment. Remember, we're no longer dealing with triggers. So there's no environmental assessment happening with the navigable waters. We're no longer protecting navigable waters. We're just protecting navigation. So you could have navigation barred as well. Um, if it's an unprotected river and someone built a dam across that river, maybe that river gives access to traditional hunting and fishing grounds for First Nations people. Maybe uh, somebody builds a bridge or a wharf on a lake that actually blocks access to your home uh, in Dartmouth, the city of lakes. It could happen. There are only two protected waters, if you don't count the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there are only two protected waters in Nova Scotia. So it is, you know, it has been sort of downgraded to not be about environment, but it used to be about environment. But even still, we can, we can see the links there. We can see how this relates to our lives. Um, in the time we have left, so have there been any positive pieces of legislation for the environment? Because this was a really big friggin' deal and has changed the landscape for environmental protections. Um, why? Well, if you look at Mike D'Souza, Mike D'Souza is a, a journalist. Uh, he writes a lot on environment. He does great work. And he did a lot of access to information requests, eight tips. And basically, all the meetings with the oil and gas industry, whatever they wanted, which was this, they got it. Uh, to the point that I actually think they got things they didn't even ask for. Uh, but Mike D'Souza has very carefully detailed through access to information requests uh, all the meetings and what the proposals were going in and, and we know what came out. So this is for the oil and gas industry. This is a big, great big gift with a bow on it for them to the detriment of our environment. What are the positive pieces of, of legislation for the environment that have been brought forward? Well, three parks were created uh, since I took on this portfolio. Sable Island 
National Park, Rouge National Urban Park, and Natsicho uh, National Park. And as the critic, going back to this idea of the critic and the, and the minister, as the critic, it's my job to analyze the bills and then give advice to my colleagues and say, here's my analysis, here's what our values are, or our principles, and here's my recommendation on how we should vote. You would think with parks it wouldn't be that controversial. You would think it would have been simple, but believe it or not, for Sable Island, which is actually in my writing, Sable Island National Park, I gave a recommendation to vote yes, and I got some pushback, uh, which surprised me. Uh, we voted yes, eventually, I guess I was convincing. Uh, Rouge, Rouge National Urban Park, I actually recommended that we voted no, and I got some pushback. Uh, it's hard to vote no on a park, uh, but we ended up voting no on that, and Nancy Cho, everybody agrees, everybody, everybody agrees on Nancy Cho. There's been good community consultation there, it's fabulous. Um, I can get into the reasons why for the yes or no in the Q&A if you like, but it's pretty heavy on the details, so I'll, uh, I'll skip it right now. Uh, so we have had the three parks bills, and otherwise, like it's, it's crickets, right? Like, ching, ching, ching. There's tumbleweeds going through the environment committee room, because we're studying nothing. <laughs> we just did a study on municipal waste. I'm a federal elected official. <laughs> I'm not a municipal elected official. We had witnesses who wouldn't even come because they're like, this is a waste of my time. You're not a city council. Why would I come talk to you about municipal waste? I mean, we're not doing things on environment, let alone on climate change, the single most important issue facing us today as a planet. So that's where we are um, 2011 to present day. What about a price on carbon as a potential solution to fight climate change? And I'll wrap up. Well, so I've covered 2011 to 2015, beginning of 2015. What happens this year? Election. Election. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so this is an election year. This is a really important year to talk about environment and get political parties to react and engage and promise and, and hold their feet to the fire on environment. So I'll do a little small parentheses on a price on carbon. Um, because the parties are starting to flesh out where they stand on environment issues and what their positions uh, are in the face of an election. Obviously, I am a member of one of those parties, so uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll try to present the facts. <laughs> uh, the, the Conservative Party of Canada, well, they used to have cap and trade in their platform. Uh, but they now have demonized it, and, and that is a statement of fact. If you watch question period, you see that they have, have taken anything about a price on carbon, they now call it a carbon tax, no matter what the policy is. I guess their focus group testing has told them that saying tax, it's like a bad word and they'll win votes. Uh, so they constantly stand up and uh, accuse the opposition writ large of wanting to implement a $21 billion carbon tax that will increase the price of everything. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because they say it every day. Uh, so there's no uh, plan for a price on carbon. Their plan to reduce um, greenhouse gases is a sector by sector approach, tackling one sector at a time. Transportation, uh, what we've been doing is following the US. Quite frankly, they've introduced regulations and we've followed suit. Uh, we've tackled coal electricity, coal fired electricity, but in my opinion, um, the Timelines are too long. We need shorter timelines to actually get provinces to act sooner rather than later. And then uh, the oil and gas sector is the largest and fastest growing sector for GHG emissions. And recently, under questioning from me, uh, the Prime Minister said that to regulate that sector would be crazy. So they're not going to do it. I, that's what I read into that anyway. Uh, so. The greenhouse gas reductions we've seen government take credit for, really, you can ask any analyst, including the Environment Commissioner, they're all very clear that the, the reductions we've seen have been thanks to the provinces and the work that they're doing, and thanks, believe it or not, to a slowdown in the economy, which is not necessarily something that we want to see. Uh, NDP has a Climate Change Accountability Act with legislated targets. So actually putting targets into legislation so that we have to meet them. How would we meet them? 
the NDP is committing to a price on carbon with a cap and trade uh, plan, and then would invest those revenues into other uh, measures to bring down our emissions, like energy efficiency or renewables. Uh, liberals, this is an ever-changing landscape because uh, uh, Trudeau just made an announcement. What's today? Tuesday? So it must have been last week. Uh, Monday, Monday. It's today, Monday? Yep. So it was definitely last week. Uh, made an announcement last week uh, saying that he would bring together the provinces to talk about a strategy, um, but has not offered a target for how much would be reduced or uh, an amount for what a price would be on carbon or even that there would be a price on carbon. Uh, so that's changing and evolving right now. So now's the time. Call your candidates. Talk to your candidates. Tell them what you want to see. Tell them what's important to you. And it's not just about this riding, because I'm the MP in this riding. It is about <laughs> 337 other ridings. So how do we do this across Canada? There, there are ways to do it. There are great environmental organizations. Environmental Defense, uh, Greenpeace, Clean Energy Canada. You know, pay the five bucks and become a member. Start getting their emails so you know what's going on. You know, oh, this thing's happening. I should write a letter to my MP about this. There's a petition I can sign. You can share that stuff with your friends. Also, an organization like Greenpeace, it matters to them to be able to say to the Minister of Environment, you should sit down with us because we represent 10,000 members. Right, like be a member. Being a member, I know you're, a lot of you students, you're busy, being a member matters. Uh, get their emails, share them. Write letters to the editor. Um, politicians, we read the front page, we skim the headlines, then we flip to letters to the editor. Because as important as the news is how people are interpreting the news. Write letters to the editor. Uh, think about doing mass letters of support or condemnation from the student union, from your uh, coworkers, you know, from whatever group you belong to saying, we think there should be a price on carbon, as an example. Uh, we believe that in 2015, this should happen. So think about ways to come together with other people and demand something different. If there is a party or a person that you think is great, think about going door to door. You know, think about working on their campaign. Uh, I know a lot of you are students and you don't necessarily live here. Think about when you go home helping someone out, even if it's just to get their message out. Um, hold panel discussions, hold film screenings, invite people to come to your school and give talks about environment. All of this really matters and it matters so much right now. Uh, we have a, a, climate a climate crisis on our hands, but we have an incredible opportunity with this 2015 election. Uh, we are only one election away from having a price on carbon and also having real action on climate change. So I hope uh, that I have convinced you that you need to be a part of it. Thanks very much. There's about 10 minutes if anybody has any questions or comments or wants to tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, uh, are we an election away from getting those acts fixed or, yeah. Uh, that is a really tough question for me to answer. And I'm not saying that like a cagey politician. Um, so something like the Fisheries Act. Yeah, I could, write, I could write the legislation and change it like that. It's actually that easy. But then when I talk to scientists, they tell me that because of the layoffs at Environment Canada and the cuts to funding to Environment Canada, we don't actually have the capacity to do the work and do the monitoring. So there will be a period of time of rebuilding that capacity and investing in science and scientists. So that's one example. Environmental Assessment Act is another example. Do you, do you guys, uh, I was gonna ask if you knew a profit tell, but, um, the Environmental Assessment Act in 2011, yeah, in 2011, I was on a monthly phone call, conference call, with folks who were really experts in SIA because we want to talk about how to make it better because it wasn't working. So I'm hard pressed now. Now I'm like, give me something inadequate back. <laughs> I want the inadequate legislation. I won't complain. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I complain. 
But I wouldn't want to bring that back because it, it wasn't as good as it could have been. So that's a tougher question, right? So I think it's going through each piece. This is easy, this is, this is not easy. This, this is easy, but then we need to change the trigger. So it's a long answer to your question, but yeah. It really does depend on what. So, for example, a, a cap and trade system, just as an example, if that's something that you've supported. We know that Environment Canada has done the work to figure it out because it used to be part of the governing party's platform. So we know it's ready, right? So that's that's nothing. That is like next week. Uh, so it, it's case by case, and I don't want to, you know, fake it. Yeah. Say, be easy. On muzzling scientists, that's a cultural issue, right? I mean, if you create a culture where all government scientists need to run a press release through the prime minister's office, if it's a press release about the mating habits of bears, which is a real example, uh, <laughs> that's cultural. Um, is it enough for a party to say, well, we would change that culture? Absolutely. Uh, I think I, I'll say that to you, but will I do it? Right? It's much more convenient if the scientists stay quiet and don't say that we're doing the wrong thing on, on our policies, right? So that, that is a real tension where civil society needs to push like hell. So, uh, you know, Tony runs as an independent, and the independent party wins. And, and he says, we're going to give freedom to the government scientists. It's not enough to just elect him and his party on that. It has to be vigilance, and it has to be us as community saying, hey, you promised. So, so where is this? And, and make it a real issue. And I was chatting with some props before this, and I was saying, yeah, here on campus, sure, everybody knows that, of course, we should base policy on evidence and research and science. But you know what, when I'm going door to door on any street in Halifax, people always bring it up with me. They, they really, it's captured people's imagination, this idea that, yeah, we need to make decisions based on evidence. But I think we can, we can, we can. We need the political will and we need, the, we need community to say, yeah, that's what we want. We can. So what, Sia, takes time. So what? So yeah, let's make the time, right? We spend a couple of years of like good consultation with experts and then we introduce a bill, right? That's, that's what my job is. Uh, so don't let the timelines uh, scare you. I just wanted to give a really truthful answer about what's easy and what's not easy. Just because it's not easy doesn't mean we can't do it. think they don't care about environment. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have the answer. No. I don't. Uh, you know, I do, I, it, I think it's more complicated than, um, you know, saying, well, the Conservative Party is at the behest of the oil and gas companies because they make campaign contributions. Well, they don't, right? Because we don't have, uh, you can't make campaign contributions in that way in Canada. The max is uh, 1,200 as an individual. A company can't make a donation, a union can't make a donation, only a person can. So uh, I, it's, it's bigger than that. Um, it is maybe a little bit about geography and where those MPs are from. Uh, and the economic powerhouse that oil and gas is in, in, some of, in a couple of those provinces, two, two of our provinces. Um, it is long-standing relationships. I mean, if you look back in the history of, uh, um, you know, Harper's history as a politician, he has had long-standing relationships with the oil and gas industry. But, you know, it's not, I'm not up here to say that industry is evil either. I mean, it is no. part of our economy, 100%. But you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And if you are going to put our collective resources into promoting um, the energy economy, 
don't you think you should be promoting a diverse energy economy, right? Why aren't we investing in greens? If we go back to the example of the oil sands, and remember how I said 50 years ago we wouldn't have had environmental assessment because we didn't know we could do it. We didn't know we could do it. How in the hell do you get oil out of this sticky sand in northern Alberta and Saskatchewan? Well, we sent some plucky scientists up there uh, on a lick and a prayer and said, go research this and figure it out. And they got nowhere for the longest time. And it was always this, oh my gosh, it might even be a waste of money to put, you know, why are we putting so many resources into trying to figure this out? Well, it was, it was our money, it was government money to do science and figure it out and, and realize that challenge. And we did it. It's quite spectacular. So you know what? Suncor, and Esso, and Shell, and Syncrude, they don't need our help anymore. They, they've got it figured out and they're making money. And yet we continue to give them subsidies to the tune of $1.3 billion a year. When you look at Tidal, here in Nova Scotia, we're experimenting with it. Tidal is now where oil sands extraction was 50 years ago. Tidal doesn't work yet, you know, but we're almost there. And we have this experiment happening in the Bay of Fundy where they put down this giant turbine. And it was, you know, it's a great project and there's some federal money and provincial money and Nova Scotia Power is involved. And they put this turbine down and a couple months later, the, the turbine blew apart. Like it's self-destructed. And the initial reaction was, oh man, you know, they don't even know what they're doing. What a failure. Of course it's a failure. I can't believe you blew apart. It shows you that, you know, you can't make this work. Are you kidding me? The fact that engineers and scientists and specialists who know how to do this, they built a turbine and the tides are so strong. There is so much power that it blew apart the turbine. That is an incredible success. And that's experimentation. And we need to invest in that experimentation. We need to invest in helping the new energy technologies get a leg up. We need to invest in those small wind renewables who are using our Nova Scotia community feed-in tariff to make their communities better and stronger and more resilient. That's where we should be investing. Wow, I didn't answer your question. I went on no, a tirade. No, 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 that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome, that's awesome. You know what, the stuff I was talking about, community engagement, it all matters. It really does. When I first got elected in 2008, I was getting letters about, um, not violence against women, that's the hugest understatement. Um, some people call it femicide, wiping out women, but the attack on women in the Democratic Republic of Congo, using rape as a, as a weapon in the Congo. I was getting letters about it from constituents, right? Like just folks like you. And so I went to our critic. I went to Paul Dewar, who was our foreign affairs critic. And I said, Paul, I'm getting all these letters about um, Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, like, why, you know, is there something in particular? Like, that is it in the news right now? Like, what's happening? Why am I getting these letters? And Paul said, I have no idea why you're getting those letters because nobody gets letters on the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo. And then he stopped and he said, oh, wait a minute, Halifax, right. And he said, you've got, or at the time, you've got the Pearson Peacekeeping Institute. You have two international development studies um, departments at two different universities. You have Pugwash Peacekeepers. You have a long storied history of peace movement and voice of women for peace and people who are engaged on foreign affairs issues. That collective sensibility in this community of Halifax has shaped my response to issues around foreign affairs. So all of that, like you think, you know, holding a film screening where like six raging grannies show up doesn't matter, it matters. It all, it, like it changes the culture of a community. So all that stuff, all that stuff. Yeah, it's 100% a secret. I can talk about it in general terms, yeah. but uh, anything that happens in camera, if I, yeah, I you know, say it, then I, I don't know what happens. I guess I get <laughs> reprimanded well, by the speaker. Well, no, you don't need a reason, yeah. So it, it, it could be just as simple as that? Yeah, and so, 
this is me. Like, it, like I know it seems weird that that's where I sit, but this is actually the seating plan. <laughs> so this is me as the environment critic. And there, there is party line, right? Uh, so my, my other three folks are there. Maybe they're really passionate about the issue of the day. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just trying to get through the day and they've got no idea what the hell we're doing at committee today. I'm the one sort of like, quote unquote, in charge, right? On the conservative side, it's the parliamentary secretary, who's sort of like the junior minister. And the PS is in charge. And the PS, like, if the PS says we're voting for this, you're voting for it. Uh, or you are under like some pretty serious, I don't know, you get time in the bad dog box, I don't know how it works over there. Um, I have seen, and I don't, this wasn't in camera actually, I have seen, uh, the PS and I actually, I managed to get her to agree with me on something. And uh, this, this guy is like a real rabble rouser, Woodworth. <laughs> and, and he's like arguing against me about like, no, 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 we can't, la, 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 la. And then the parliamentary secretary spoke via the chair and said, Mr. Chair, I would like the members, uh, my members on my side to realize that I am the parliamentary secretary and we are voting for. And it was done. Like in that moment, it was good for me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, so that's, it's, it's the PS, and the PS works out of the minister's office in theory, but, but really out of the prime minister's office. Yeah. Yeah. There are moments where we don't even have a vote because I know what's going to happen, right? So I'll talk about the clock just for shits and giggles. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. Andy? Thanks, and I'll do the, try and do this quickly uh, because we are a little bit over five. Um, and then, uh, if anybody wants more details, um, ask me. Uh, how would I improve? Thank you for asking the question that way because I'm really sick of this. You know, this way is carbon tax is better, or cap and trade is better, fee and dividend is better. You know what? I want a price on carbon, <laughs> and if there's going to be a price on carbon, I want it to be designed in the best way possible. So how do we do it? Well, one thing that I would do, and this is perfect, your example of Europe. Uh, so, um, er, well, failures around the world. Um, so Europe, uh, the European Union had a, a pretty big failure when the economy tanked. Uh, you heard me talk about here in Canada, our emissions went down, right? Because we're not producing as much. So same thing happened in Europe. The emissions went down just quite naturally because the economy uh, was, was on, the, on the slide. So then cap and trade didn't work. <laughs> right? Uh, there's nothing, we didn't have a cap that we needed to worry about. So Europe, uh, the EU, is doing a tremendous thing and they almost have, they might not like the way I put this, but they almost have like these cap and trade ambassadors where if you are a jurisdiction trying to set up cap and trade, they'll send someone to come talk to you to talk about like, this is where we got it wrong, this is how you can improve it, uh, this is a problem, keep an eye out for this. So for me, it is about a well-designed program. So I would absolutely look at what it is that other jurisdictions have learned and, and how it is working and how it's not working and, and base it on best practices, uh, first and foremost. The other thing with uh, low income, because that's really a big, big, big deal for me, is what do we do about low income? Um, people say, you know, jack the price up for gas because then people will use less of it. Jack the price up for oil because people will use less of it. Well, if you're a low-income person in Nova Scotia, you live on $6 a day if you're on welfare. Okay? So you could change your light bulb that costs $6, put in a CFL light bulb, use less, recoup that money over the course of a year and a half. Or you could take that $6 and you could eat. Right? These are real, like I know, in my old work um, at Dali Dali, I knew people who cut their pills in half so they could save money, or take their pills every other day, or not get their prescriptions filled at all. There are people in our province that go to the food bank and pretend they have cats so that they can get cat food. That is real. So the answer isn't jacking up the price so that people will conserve. 
the answer is looking at an equitable, uh, you know, uh, how to design a policy that is more equitable. So for low income and cap and trade, there has to be a specific component for low income people. And so the way I envision that, I'm open to other suggestions, is you have revenues from cap and trade, you invest them into other programs to bring down your greenhouse gas emissions, but they have to be targeted for low income as well. You need specific programs targeting low income. A perfect example here in Nova Scotia, we have Efficiency Nova Scotia, which is North America's only arm's length energy efficiency utility. So it's a utility, imagining that energy efficiency is a thing that, you know, we have to have a utility. We're, this is energy. They have specific targeted low income programs that are not the most cost effective. They're not the low hanging fruit. Right? If you want the most cost effective, we're going to go into every commercial establishment and retrofit their lighting. But they have a program for low income because it's fair, because it's equitable. So we need, we need to do that um, and, and make legislative, you know, like there, it has to be, there has to be a component for low income. But I'm also open to ideas if you have ideas. Um, and I know that we do need to wrap up. So thank you. You've been a delightful and attentive audience. Um, get out there and vote. <laughs>